house. Good, good evening, good evening. How are you doing? It's Dr. Shaw is in the house. I am joining you live from Project Forgive or the Dr. Sean page or Positive Compassion or even our group Joy is a Habit. However you got here, I'm thrilled that you're here. And I'm, what I'm hoping for this lecture tonight, I pop up every Monday at 6.30 p.m. usually. And it's usually about joy as a habit. And once a month, I do a lecture series. And tonight's lecture is on 2023, dumping toxicity and finding more joy in your life. And really, what do you want? So I'm hoping if you want to take notes, rock and roll, it doesn't matter. Breathe, sit with me, rest in this conversation. And I hope that I give you some new ideas or thoughts. Um, of course, join our Joy is a Habit Facebook group. Our focus is joy. We really believe that joy is a habit and it's something you practice. If you're new, please tell us. Hi, Terry. I see you guys. Hi, Lori. Hi, Annette. If you're new, tell us. I also keep getting these messages from Facebook about notices for stars. Apparently, Facebook gives you stars and ask people to give them to you. So if you have stars and you want to dump them, we'll take them because we use them. It's a small amount of money and we use them to put people in our trainings and uh, especially if they can't afford it or uh, are struggling to find the tuition cost. Perfect. Um, so with that said, tonight's going to be about finding and implementing more joy in 2023 and I got an email today from Notes from the Universe. Does anybody else get Notes from the Universe? Um, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. If you can think of his name, put it in the notes, okay? Or put it in the comments. And I loved the message today. The message today was every problem, challenge, or issue shows up in your life with three questions. I'm like, well, that's frickin' perfect, okay? And the question, is, the three questions are, and I'll put these in the, in the comments and in the post when I'm done doing the lecture, 15, 20 minutes for the lecture. And the three questions are, are you ready to see things differently? Well, heck yeah. Are you ready to live at a higher level? Well, yeah. And are you ready to know even greater joy? Double yay. Yes, I am. And then it says, it's a very short email. It says, but you really only have to answer the first one. And it says, are you ready to see things differently? And that's really really the conversation tonight because you may or may not know this many of you will know it new year's resolutions are a myth they don't work <laughs> they never have they never will the percentages in statistical research are very small just like forgive and forget there's a lot of myths around forgiveness forgive and forget is a myth it's a myth how are you going to forgive and forget someone murdered your daughter? That is not going to happen. There's little things that you can forgive and forget. And I always say when someone cuts you up on the freeway, I can forgive and forget that pretty systematically, pretty easily. But the big stuff, no. No, I'm not going to forget it, and I don't want to repeat behaviors. So we come from the model of forgive and remember. And um, so here's some summary and some key findings about New Year's resolutions. I'm really going to encourage you not to do it and to do something else instead, which is what I'll get to. Nearly 40% of US, U.S. adults set New Year's resolutions every year. Almost 60% of young adults, 18 to 34, have New Year's resolutions. So we got to talk to our young people and tell them, stop it, don't do it, which is the largest demographic that actually sets New Year's resolutions. The, the primary New Year's resolutions, there's three of them. They always have to do with health, whether it's vowing to exercise more, eat healthier, and to lose weight. Health is always at the top of the list. And um, up to 25% quit in the first week. I would say it's even higher in the first three days. <laughs> um, only just over 30% make it past the first month. And it's, uh, this study that I, just, I saw, looked at a lot of studies, 9% of us actually keep our New Year's resolutions. What does that mean? Does that mean for three months, six months, a year? I have no clue. I couldn't find exact data. I'm a researcher. I like exact data, okay? There's a lot of reasons why we can't keep New Year's resolutions, and many of them have to do with our mindsets, our internal life. And if your behaviors don't match your goal, you're going to self-sabotage. 
So in my world, doing New Year's resolutions is setting yourself up for failure, okay? So I found some lists of alternatives to New Year's resolutions, so I want to tell you a few of them, and like I said, I will put them in the comments or, you know, up at the top of the post when, I'm, when I say goodbye. Here's some of the alternatives I thought were pretty cool. Um, make a 2022, or excuse me, 2023 bucket list. Do you have a bucket list? You can be as creative as you want. You can create a monthly challenge or a monthly word. I have a word for the year. My word for the year overarching theme is joy. That's just my word. And underneath joy is the word freedom. I want more internal freedom, less martyrdom, less guilt, more doing the things I want to be doing that bring me joy. So joy and freedom are kind of going to be my theme for next year. Um, try gratitude exercises. That's a great thing to do instead of New Year's resolutions. Practice mindfulness, make realistic lists, whatever that means. Vision boards. I've done vision boards in the past, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to, if I want one this year. It's more about what I want, not what I don't want. And I've gone back and have saved my vision boards, and many of the things that I visualized have come true, many of them. Um, another thing that I really liked is creating a list of things to look forward to in the new year. And for me, that's a list of hope. I love hope. At the same time, my husband hates that word for whatever reason. It's not strategic. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. To me, hope is an essence. Hope is equal to faith to me. And I have a lot of strong hope. And when I'm not feeling hope, I'm pretty down. So hope is significant to me. So it depends on what, how you really relate to the word, right? And the shared meaning of the word. And I found a study that showed anticipation, like hope, um, looking forward to something, is such a strong feeling, and that many of us are happier in anticipation of, a, of an event rather than remembering the actual experience. Like if you're getting ready to go on a cruise, like that week before, do you know what I'm doing? Like you're just so excited to go on the cruise, it's coming up. I pack early, I think about stuff, what am I gonna do? And uh, the anticipation to me is very joyful, and I love that experience of anticipation. So I'm thinking about what anticipation am I going to create this year? Me and my husband were talking about going on a cruise in Iceland. Don't know if that's going to happen. I'm kind of playing with that a little bit. Well, maybe we can do that. He's not a big into cruises. I love cruises. He's not big into it unless it's a destination that he loves, and he's always wanted to go to Iceland and Norway. So who knows? We'll see. But I'm, and I'm starting to figure out what are some of my lists of things I'm going to look forward to in 2023. I'm also saying no to a lot of things. You know, uh, I'm not doing things out of martyrdom. Wait, let me get to martyrdom. Let me just... The, the other thing about focusing on is engaging in self-reflection or mindfulness. Let me write that thought down. I was just going to say about martyrdom. And... Because I'll forget if I don't. Okay. So, in the self-reflection conversation, what it really means is careful thought about your own behavior and your own beliefs. Oh, it's, it's actually a lot of the research that I was reading and from my own experience. This has been done, only goals can be reached and targets set if you're really doing that internal work. That's just my experience, my belief system. And when you start the practice of self-reflection, it can really help you. And here's, some, here's a couple of questions, how's that? Ask yourself, and these again, I'll put in the, the notes when this is over, what things matter the most to you? What matters most to you? No, your remote, your automatic answer might be my family. But what does that mean and what does that look like? And one of my self-reflection ideas is my family does matter the most to me. And, uh, and how I see it in action, tomorrow's a work day for me. It's actually a time I get a lot of stuff done between Christmas and New Year's. And um, my daughter asked me to babysit for many reasons. I'm taking the whole day off and I'm going to go babysit my granddaughter with no guilt, no upset, with pure joy. I know I'm supporting her and that's what I'm choosing to do. It's not a sacrifice. I'll have a lot of fun, right? I'm even going to go there tonight and spend the night 
and hang out with my granddaughter in the morning, okay? Other questions to ask yourself that are non-resolution actions are, what are your greatest strengths and how can you build on them? What are your greatest strengths and how can you build on them? That's a good question to ask yourself. Another one that I've been asking is, how do I want people to remember me? I want people to remember me as loving, kind, committed, all of those. Um, also, what am I grateful for? And how can I build upon the things that I'm grateful for? Here's an example. So me and my husband have been doing a lot of work on closing loops and cleaning clutter. I'm a martyr for sure. I'm really doing a lot of self-reflection to release martyrdom. Like, I like wear it a badge of honor. I got all the Christmas shopping done. Everything was, was I'm a, I celebrate Christmas. And for you, if you don't celebrate Christmas, I know there's more than 14 different philosophies, religions, and ways to celebrate. So I'm talking about Christmas because that's for me. And I'm not discounting anyone for what they do. And uh, so we're cleaning the clutter. And uh, my husband says to me, because I'm wearing my badge of honor after doing all of the shopping for Christmas and everything, because I was done pretty much like December 5th. And my husband, I sent him an article that I thought was really poignant. And it was about emotional labor for women. That women carry, and I know every woman on this is gonna relate, we carry all the emotional labor, or a lot of the emotional labor from, at the holidays especially, coordinating, fixing, returning, cooking, cleaning, and it's just escalated during the month of December during the, during the holiday. And my husband said to me, but three nights ago, he says, you know what, sweetie? I appreciate everything you've done to make Christmas so exquisite for our family. I'd like to be a part of that next year. Now, usually you'd think that would be music to your ears, like, yes, help me, I need help. Not me. There's something that I'm getting that I need to look at in my self-reflection about being the martyr. Because I'm like, oh geez, he's gonna do it wrong. He's not gonna do it my way. I make decisions very quickly. He doesn't make decisions like that. Like, there's something, there's some juice in there for me in self-reflection. And it would take some emotional intelligence to let him help me. Because I, ah, oh, I'll do it myself. I'll get it done faster and easier. And what if I have another option? What if the other option is, ooh, I can do this with my husband. It won't be done as fast. I will experience some connection. I love the, t the term collective effervescence, which is a communication term about creating connectivity and, uh, and doing a task or an action together. And uh, I'm gonna take that on for several things this year, not just the holiday shopping. And also too, what habits can I improve on? That was another question that I was thinking about pretty good with the water thing and uh, so that's another one. Another thing I saw that I thought was pretty darn cool, I see you guys there, hello, was follow a book's message. The one that immediately comes to mind for me is uh, Shonda Rhyme, Shonda Land, I love her, she's like my shiro in television production because I'm a television producer. She's, she's a bad butt, I would swear but I'm on Facebook so I'm not going to, she is a bad butt, she is something, I love this woman. And uh, she wrote a book called The Year of Yes. If you know about it or want to check it out, go check it out. Um, exquisite, exquisite book. I read it several years ago. I, I'm probably due to read it again. So following a message of a book. Um, here's one that I don't know how you're going to hear, but I'm going to take the risk. I'm reading a book. I just read the book, Thank God My Mom Died. The book was wonderful all about self-reflection, especially if you come from a complicated family system, whether it's abuse, whatever's going on in your family system or has gone on in your family system, the book is just wonderful. I'm reading a book right now that's called God is a Black Woman. Now, it's not meant literally, it's from a PhD, what is her name? I gotta go look her up, her name is Dr. Christina Cleveland. And this book is phenomenal. Just, you know, people that are putting, let me come back to the book. People that are putting messages, apologize for the privacy abruptly. I'll delete them all and ban them all. Pay no attention to them. Just let them go. 
that's extra energy we don't need. So as soon as this is over, I'll make sure they're all gone because it's so inappropriate. And they still do it, and they're going to do it. There's no use getting upset about it. It's like, that's what they do, and we'll just delete them and ban them. It's all good, okay? So this book, God is a Black Woman, has really struck a lot of chords for me in my own relationship with God. I seek God. That's my relationship. I know that people have Allah, Buddha. There's so many other. Muhammad is a prophet. We make no decision or discrepancy about what you believe or how you believe. We welcome it all. And this book was given to me by a very dear friend of mine, a woman of color, who's actually a dear friend. I love her dearly. And she said, you've got to read this book. And the academic research in it is beyond stellar. It's causing me to critically think in ways I never have. It's actually having me feel closer to God in my own personal spiritual practices. It's just a beautiful book because I'm one of the things I'm committed to, and I have been committed to, I work in diversity, I know many of you know that, that um, I'm not a DE&I trainer, that's not what I do. I do a lot in critical thinking. I'm a white woman, I, it's not a fit for me to be a white woman and teach diversity. That's not what I do. Although critical thinking comes up in many of the trainings that I do. And um, so I'm really in this conversation of understanding experiences for black women as a white woman. Stuff I've never addressed or I've never looked at. And it's been very joyful to explore this for me. And it's created so much empathy and has me really look at myself in ways I've never looked at myself. It's pretty natural. So following a book's message is a, is a great one. And here's the last thing that I wanted to share with you. I'm, um, if weight, the top three are weight, exercise, losing weight, is the third one. I'll go back to it, I can't remember. Three of them, vowing to exercise, eating healthier, and losing weight. That's a theme globally, actually. And what if you did some self-reflection and went a little bit deeper if you're really struggling with your weight, because this is the conversation I'm having, is what if heavy, the word heavy, is it? Not trying to lose weight because I'm heavy, trying to exercise more because I'm heavy, trying to eat healthier because I'm heavy. What if what's going on in my mind and my self-reflection, I have things in my mind that are so heavy. And for me, that's what dumping toxicity is all about is, okay, what if this is a theme, okay? A good movie for themes, not about weight, was the Slumberland. If you have Netflix, check out Slumberland. That movie was exquisite. We watched it yesterday with my husband and grandchildren. My husband loves this movie. It's a great movie on analogies, which I think are beautiful ways, parables, to learn things. And so my analogy or parable is around heavy this year. And that means I'm closing loops, things that are heavy in my brain, like clutter. So what the heck does that mean? My mother died, it's been two years ago, and uh, my sister also died, so I got all their pictures. I have pictures in my basement of people, I have no clue who they are. I just could not throw them away. So I've been going through the pictures in the basement, taking digital pictures of things that feel important to me to put them on a file, and I'm saying goodbye to pictures. One of the things my son asked me is that before you throw anything away, would you send them to me? He lives in California, so I can go through them to see what I would like. And I'm like, absolutely. Just this process, I feel lighter. Okay, that's one example. My mother was a hairdresser. That's what she did for a living. She's the only one that did my hair until I was 52 years old. Okay, I'm 58 right now. And she stopped doing it when she started, you know, getting older and not being able to cut hair and she retired. She had, in her basement, she did hair in her basement, she had her own shampoo, she had her own cream rinse, she had her own hairspray. So all this stuff was in the basement and I've been using all her hairspray and all her conditioner. It's in my bathroom and in my closet. And I'm finishing up the last of the jugs. And um, it feels really good to say goodbye to these jugs of shampoo, these jugs of hairspray, these jugs. 
because I didn't realize the heaviness and pain that I was keeping in my bathroom that didn't feel joyful to me. It's okay to release her. I'm at that stage. I'm, it's okay to release my mama. And so those are the kinds of clutter things that have me feel heavy that I'm releasing. And I got privy to this a couple of months ago. I always have, I own, I own my own business. I travel quite a bit, less with the pandemic, but it's starting to pick up again. And I always had a pile of stuff that was this thick that I just needed to get done, whether it's organize it, put it in a file, blah, blah. I've been carrying around that pile of stuff for five years. Some of those notes in that pile were seven years old. And every time I look at this pile of stuff, I feel bad. And I said, what if I just went through that pile, dumped what I don't want or I'm never going to do, and just don't have a pile? That pile is gone. I can't tell you emotionally how good I feel about that. I'm hoping this is giving you some ideas for you, whatever that might be. I have a training this week. I'm training on Thursday. I have, when I train, I have tons of videos, graphics, bullet points, all kinds of stuff. And every time I do a training, it's a hot mess. There's so much material to go through to say, what am I going to do for this group? I've been clearing clutter and systematizing all the videos, all the graphics, so that I will never have to go through the trauma of trying to find stuff in this system. And it feels so good. Here's another thing that happened. Um, my husband is aligned with me. Usually a lot of our surface fights would be about, get this done, get that done. You never do what you're saying to do. That's from me. And it's been shifting the last four or five months. And one of my things that I want done is the garage. He's got a lot of his stuff in the garage. And I was working on the training today, and he says, hey, go check out the garage. It's pretty much done. What I was interested in feeling and noticing is that I wasn't elated that he got it done. Like, oh, off my back. Oh, what a burden off my back. I was actually happy and feeling neutral in the happiness and joy that we're on the same page. That to me is beautiful, rather than hoping he'll do something to fix my feelings, right? We're on the same page. There's a big difference, and that's about that mindfulness stuff. That's about self-reflection. Whether my husband does this or does that or doesn't do this or does that, I, let, I have let that impact my happiness and my joy. There's no hot dog down that hole. There's other ways to communicate, to get on the same page and get things done as a couple in joy. And that's probably been my biggest life lesson this year, and I want to expand upon that. Hoping that makes sense to you. For those just joining, we just did a session on dumping toxicity, focusing on what we really want for 2023. Dump and dump and dump and New Year's resolutions, all that. I see you guys are talking. Um, I'll make sure that I make some comments and such after I finish because I'm getting ready to walk out the door to go babysit. I was part of the night tonight. And uh, this notion of doing what you want and not doing what you don't want, that's what I want to close on. My daughter is going to Niagara Falls. I live in Detroit, so driving to Niagara Falls is like a four-hour drive, and she really wanted me to go. And in the past, martyrdom, oh, go with her. She needs help with the baby, blah, blah. And I really had to ask myself, do I want to go to Niagara Falls in winter when it's freaking freezing, drive four hours, probably six hours with the baby, six hours back, when I've been working all this week, I have a couple days off to refresh for next week because i got a lot going on next week at work. The answer is no, that would not bring me joy. So my answer was no. That's new for me as a 58-year-old woman. I'm finally getting to the place where I don't have to take care of everybody, don't have to be a martyr and do it all, can actually find some beautiful synergy with my husband so we're on the same page and working together in joy. If someone would have told me 10 years ago I would have this, I would have said, ah, I don't think this is ever possible. And most of it came from self-reflection, looking at myself, my own mindfulness, being willing to go under the surface rather than the surface conversation. And, um, and 
and I hope you're inspired to do some of that work or it encouraged you to keep going because it takes takes something to do this, doesn't it? It really does take something. All right. Next month, I come on every Monday, 6.30, some kind of joy as a habit, something real quick to give you a juice and keep it going and joy as a habit because it's a habit. It's a practice. And... Um, Next month, I'm going to do, at, I think it's January 30th, January 30th at 6.30. I'll put, up, I'll put that up in the next couple of days, the, the actual event. It's going to be called Forgiveness is a State of Consciousness. Dispelling myths of forgiveness. Emotions you think get you closer to forgiveness, they can, yet they also block your way. Emotions can block your way to forgiveness. And if you remove the obstacles, it turns out that forgiveness is completely natural. I know, right? And generally far easier than you may have supposed. So we're going to do some new perceptions. We're going to play in forgiveness as a state of consciousness. That's what I want to take on for January 30th. That's it for now. I appreciate you guys being here. I'll put stuff in the notes. And I really look forward to being with you every week as we do some kind of a joy as I have it, exercise or conversation. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you, all you new people. Thank you for all, for all those that joined us for the first time. Mwah, 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 mwah. I wish I could have read more, but it didn't bring me joy to do it tonight because i got to get out the door to my daughter. <laughs> you got it. Uncomfortable at times. Choosing joy is uncomfortable at times. Yeah. Mm, big love. Talk to you soon.